Hey everybody, this is Andrew Greer for CCM Magazine and we're sitting down with Mr. Ryan Stevenson today. And you know, when singer, songwriter, Dove Award winner, all that stuff, but what some people may not know, and I love this story, is that really songwriting, at least as far as kind of your break in Nashville, was through songwriting. Yeah. A song that you had written with Jamie Moore, is that right? Yes, sir. That Toby Mac then ended up cutting. But you didn't know that was going to happen. That was like the farthest thing from my <laughs> mind. Yeah. You know, uh, I was actually in the, in the middle of a tour, and I was staying in, here in the Nashville area, and this one day in particular, uh, on my Google Calendar pops up uh, today, 10 a.m. Co-write with Jamie Moore, and I would just and I didn't feel good. Uh, I had tons of laundry to do. I mean, I was only <laughs> home for a day or two, and so I called my not manager and I'm like, "You're gonna have to cancel this. Like, I'm not, I'm not going today. Please cancel." He's like, "All right, fine, I'll cancel." And literally, as I sat there, this still small voice just whispered to my heart and like don't cancel this today don't be mad so i called my i called him right back i'm like hey i'll just go i feel like I'm, i don't know why i feel like i'm supposed to go do this one um come to find out jamie was up here in franklin and had just canceled on me <laughs> and but his publisher was in the building and he's like oh jamie uh he's on his way here right now he's driving here right now don't don't cancel on him so he's like okay so I walked in the door. I'll never forget it. I didn't even remember the address of the building. I walked through this old dingy looking red brick building. It's like, what do you want to work on today? Come on back. I said, you know, I got this idea. I want to write a song. I've been working on this song about how the words that we're speaking literally can bring life or death. They can change the environment around us. Mm. And that 20 minutes later, literally we had like a version of Speak Life and then Toby owns that building mm. and was coming in there working on his record called Eye On It. And Jamie began to show Toby some of the songs that we were working on for me, uh, including Speak Life. And I think Toby just heard, just heard something in there and really loved it. And he had, Toby really had a whole other uh, huge chunk of inspiration and just uh, some things that he wanted to say that felt like he could really marry his ideas into mm -hmm. what we already have with Speak Life. Mm -hmm. And so they mm -hmm. kind of took it from there and Toby released it to the world and Speak Life became yeah. Speak Life. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, when you think about it, you grew up in a town called Bonanza, Oregon. Bonanza, Oregon. Bonanza. I mean, you think about, I think about any Western fan. Everybody's like, like dun, 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 right? Yeah. Yeah, but like two, what was it, 250, 250 people? 250, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when you think about your path, I think all of our paths are so fascinating and interesting how we get from one place to the next. Did you ever think growing up that your path would land you on a platform or a stage of the magnitude that you've experienced over the past couple of years? No, never. And I guess because I grew up in such a small town in such a simple way with you know, dairy farmers mm -hmm. and cattle farmers and ranchers growing up in the country, you know, um, like I didn't get signed to a record company till I was 31 years mm -hmm. old. So I always say like I lived a lot of life yeah. before yeah, this. Yeah, you had experience, uh, yeah. So now I never thought I'd be here. I never planned to be here. And I guess I'm, I'm any amount of success, if that's what we want to call it, sure. in, is... It's such a blessing because I've I've lived in the real world for mm -hmm. so long doing and working very real things with very real people that um, this playing music and touring and, and working in a recording studio and writing songs is, is just an amazing, amazing blessing. And I'm just always so, it's just so easy to be thankful mm. because of, you know, where I've been. It's a little unreal. Yeah, it's surreal. You know, okay, so I, th I thought about this lyric from the title track, No Matter What. A lot of us grew up believing at any moment we could lose it all, and at the drop of a hat, God might turn his back and move on. I think about those upbringings. I grew up in a rural area in a Southern Baptist church, you know, and <laughs> all the different messages that just come from human lips and human hearts, trying to interpret and understand this great yeah. mystery of God. Was this your experience growing sure. up at church? Yeah, you know... You know, about that lyric, um, I grew up in a pretty Baptist in nature mm -hmm. church, a very religious environment, pretty, could could be defined as somewhat legalistic. Sure. And 
I learned very early, um, not from my parents, but just from the church, from the from leadership of the church that, hey, you know, God is moody. Hmm. God is mostly disappointed with you and and can shelve you at any point in time. Just, you know, stay within his good graces. And he's he's very loving, yes, but I mean, look at look at history. He's he's you know, hellfire and brimstone. Like yeah. that is the God we know. And what kind of kid wants to run to a loving father that mm-hmm. might treat him that way? Um, mm-hmm. And so I kind of grew up, It that environment sent me and my entire generation of those of us mm-hmm. who grew up in religious environments, it sent us all into performance-based relationship with God where we think we're only as good as our last ability to perform and do really well. Mm-hmm. And it's a cycle of dysfunction. And it wasn't until, and I'm not saying I've arrived anywhere, sure, yeah. but it wasn't until... And later into my 30s where the Lord really began to dismantle some of those old uh, strongholds in my life of thinking, you know, well, Lord, are you really going to, are you really mad at me? Are you really disappointed? Are you yeah, really yeah. going to shelve me yeah. if I mess up and fail? Mm-hmm. And it's been in the last few years where he just consistently and continuously brings me back to a place of it is not about what you are doing or who you are or who you think you are. What you've, it's about, I see you through the lens of redemption and grace and mercy. I went to the cross for you. I've mm-hmm. past, present, and future. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like I could go on and on and throw out all kinds of scripture about that. But I feel like our, so many people that I encounter in that 30-year-old generation grew up thinking that at any moment, God might be disappointed with him and might just be be done. And I want people to know that is not true. It is not right. It's a lie. And the Lord is unbelievably passionate about every detail of our life, even our failures and our mess ups. Yeah. I, I mean, I heard you say like that that kind of message of staying in his good graces, which doesn't reflect a gracious God, mm-hmm. interestingly yeah. enough. But the grace and redemption, wanting that to be, I've, I've heard over and over that how you want that to be the pivot point, this kind of crux of your music and mm-hmm. your message. How do we insert grace into, from the pulpit down to the pews, like how do we reinsert grace? That's not necessarily within the language, the natural language of religion. Yeah. But it was the beginning of the church. Right. So how do, I mean, and this just in your own opinion or your experience, how do we help culture a church of grace again? Um, I mean, it might not be simple, but I think you you dismantle the hierarchy political system of church. Mm. You read the book of Acts, everybody was on an even keel. They mm. met house to house to house as friends, as family, daily breaking bread, and thousands of people were converted daily. And numbers mm. were added daily. And now I feel like we've gotten so far away from Mm -hmm. breaking bread daily, community, relationship, doing life together, that it's now about sustaining buildings, sustaining finance, sustaining campaigns, all of that. (laughs) And I'm not bent out of shape with the church, I promise. I hope people hear my heart in that. But very simply, we we see it all the time. Um, The church is going one way and there, but there's definitely, there's definitely, a, a new movement, a new spirit, whatever you want to call it. Of, I feel like now more than ever, there's a, there's a tribe, there's a subculture of Christian people out there who have an ear to hear, who are coming back and not, not necessarily gathering around the smoke and the lights and the sure. lasers and the, the screens, but they're gathering around family. They're gathering around fathers and mothers who are nurturing, and that's how it all started anyways. Yeah. And, you and I are the church. Yeah. Right. I, I, my brother was telling me that recently because he actually kind of said, he said, I hear you saying in a couple of interviews, the church is this and church is that. He's like, church is you and me. Mm-hmm. The organization of the church has definitely failed uh, our culture and society to some degree and has flaws. And I thought that was really interesting when I, I bring it back to me. And I've heard you bring it back to like the individual and the way that we approach communion with God. You talk about community relationship with God, um, doing that as if we were once again children like I heard you say that 
these songs on this record are like letters from a child to a dad. Mm -hmm. That kind of intimate, nurturing relationship. <laughs> you know, so how do we approach God as a, like a child when we're these adults with these experiences and dilemmas and doubts? And what is the outcome of that if we do? I feel like we've stopped seeing the Lord as playful himself. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've stopped seeing him as, as a child. I feel like we have outgrown God. I feel like mm. if we can begin to come back to that place of childlike wonder and awe, and like Jesus said all the time, unless you become like one of these, you will not even see the kingdom. Like mm -hmm. everything stops unless you become a child. And and I feel like that's that is that is the nature inherently of who Jesus is, as he has that wondrous, playful, childlike thing about him as well. And I think that when we can just crawl up into his lap and just realize that he's all we need and that nothing else is going to satisfy us and that um, that we can just be with him. I just envision if he were to come in and just sit down right beside me and just like rub the back of my neck and head and just engulf me into his lap, mm -hmm. that's, that's the feeling that we all want. And I, I, I believe that that's the feeling that he wants to give. That's who he is. That's his nature, is to swoop us up into, into his, into his chest, into his lap, and just hold on to us. And we don't do that enough. We don't allow him to be that, that Abba to yeah. us. Yes. Yeah. It, I keep thinking of this imagery of him literally just looking out with us. Here we are, yeah. kind of confounded by all that's in front of us, not totally understanding. Some in awe, some in doubt and him not solving it all on the spot, but literally just being shoulder to shoulder with us. <laughs> up in the church does that mean you were aware of did you listen to Christian music yeah somewhat I mean before I listened to Christian music 
I listened to Michael Jackson. Uh, it's my better. sister, my sister brought home a a Michael Jackson Thriller cassette okay. tape. Okay. Snuck it home somehow, <laughs> and uh, my mom was like, "My mom listened to this stuff called Maranatha Praise." Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, that was what she was bumping all the time. But my sister got a hold of a Thriller cassette tape, and then my dad, my dad bought a stereo system off a guy at one of the dairy farms. And when he bought the stereo, um, whoever he bought it from had left a tape in the stereo. Okay. And it was wham, make it big. <laughs> and so I literally memorized front to back before George Michael was in. Like, it was wham. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, wham and Michael Jackson, that's what I was listening to. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> But you were aware of Amy Grant. But I was I definitely guess. aware of okay, Amy Grant. Okay, this is what I'm getting. <laughs> okay, I, kn- I knew you were going somewhere with that. <laughs> but I love it, but I, I would rather stay on Wham. Um, we love you, Amy. But uh, Amy, think about it. Like, the yeah. icon of Christian music, and to be in the room writing with her, number one, to write and then have her on the record. What's that like? Uh, How did that feel to you? Uh, like, it still makes me emotional. Um, and Amy, it's like uh, my earliest memories literally as a child are driving, riding in the back seat. You know, my, my sister was at school and my dad was away at work. So I spent a lot of time with my mom mm-hmm. and I'm the baby of the family. I'm the only son. So my mom <laughs> and I were just together a lot. Uh-huh. And my earliest memories are us driving in the car and her listening to Amy Grant tapes. My mom was a big fan of Amy Grant and like El Shaddai and this song called Giggle and like oh, I just remember them all. And so I grew up loving Amy Grant and I loved her even more because my mom loved her. I loved Amy because my mom loved Amy. Sure. Mm-hmm. And my mom in turn was like really the one my entire life who nurtured the music in me, who nurtured okay. the the fearless like you if don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something. You just go for it. You chase mm-hmm. your dreams. Like she, she cultivated the dreamer in me for mm-hmm. sure. Um, you know, and then when my mother passed away a few years back, it just, you know, I've always wanted to meet Amy. I was like, well, if I ever meet Amy, I'm going to tell her that story. Well, I actually ended up meeting her, obviously. <laughs> and we talked it out. And I, I was just so over overcome with emotion and um kind of felt like I was meeting this piece of my mom, you know? Mm -hmm. And when Mm -hmm. we asked Amy to be on my rec, I was like, man, if I could have one (laughs) female on the planet to do a duet with, to do a feature with, it would be Amy Grant. And she's definitely going to say no. (laughs) (laughs) She's not going to do it. She's a, she's a massive deal. She's a star. Like she's just a big deal. And like, I'm just me and uh, from Bonanza. And she just did it. And she, She's just so amazing like that, so gracious and, and just came right in and spent the whole day in the studio with us and working on it and killed it and just was no red tape, no hoops mm-hmm. to jump through with her. She was just so kind and it it was, it's amazing. I bet your I'm mom, so honored that she's a part of it. I bet your mom thought that was yeah. awesome. Too. <laughs> Full circle. Full circle. Thanks for being with us. Of course. Friends.